Hey, welcome back. Last time I mentioned that we were going to be taking a look at certainty and probability, but I decided to break those down into a couple different shorter videos. So today we're going to start by taking a look at evaluating probability. So why don't we go ahead and take a look. Now, since we're going to be focusing on evaluating empirical probability, it'll be a good idea to start with some definitions so that you know exactly what we're talking about. Empirical probability is the examination of empirical evidence to determine the probable conclusion in an inductive situation. But that probably doesn't help very much. So what do we mean by empirical? Well, empirical means derived from or relying upon experience or observation. And probability, the likelihood or chance that something is the case. Something that is supported by evidence strong enough to establish presumption but not necessarily proof. There are four considerations for evaluating an inductive argument composed of empirical data. We can talk about extension, nature of the situation, manner or procedure that's employed, and our background knowledge. So let's go ahead and take each of these in turn, starting with extension. Extension is how many cases are examined. In other words, how broad is the sample? The more cases, the stronger the induction. So for example, the presidential approval rating more accurately reflects reality the more citizens are polled. So which would be more reliable, an approval rating based on 20 people or 20,000 people? Clearly, 20,000 people. When we talk about the nature of a situation, we're asking how representative is the evidence? In other words, how like the real world was the testing environment? The more the sampling reflects real-world conditions and environment, the stronger the induction. So, for example, here, when we're determining the presidential approval rating, were the 20,000 people polled all Republicans? That would skew the results. If the U.S. population is 60% urban and 40% rural, did the poll reflect that distribution? And so on. So let's consider extension and nature taken together. How might one estimate the amount of red meat consumed daily by the average American? U.S. population currently as of 2021 is 332 million people. And here are two options. A, we pull every American. B, we pull a sample of the population. What are the pros and cons of each? If we pull every American, we would obviously get a more accurate number, possibly a complete induction, assuming everyone answered truthfully. But imagine the difficulty of pulling that off. If we pull a sample, it won't be as accurate in principle but at least it's going to be more practical. So now, let's conduct a sample study. Who do we poll? A, people exiting the butcher shop. B, people living in San Francisco. Or C, a random selection of people from across the country. Well, it's not A or B. And why is that? Well, we can predict that A is going to lead to an overestimate of red meat consumption because butcher shops tend to cater to the meat-eating segment of the population. And even if those customers are not all red meat eaters, it'll more likely be a larger proportion than found among the general population. We can also predict that B is going to lead to an underestimate, given that a city like San Francisco probably has a higher than average number of health and environmentally conscious vegetarians and vegans. While C gives us the best chance of capturing a true cross-section of Americans. And of course, chance is the operative term. Okay, in selecting a random sample, what is the best sample size? A, do we select 200 people? B, 1,500 people? Or C, 20,000 people? There are pros and cons with each choice here, right? We already said the larger the sample, the better the induction. So 20,000 would give us the best estimate. But on the downside, it's more difficult to acquire the data. 200 or 1,500 is much easier. And between those two, 1,500 is going to give you the more accurate estimate. And as we're going to see in a second, it's generally not worth going much beyond that. We'll see why. But whatever the size of the sample, we want to avoid what's called a biased sample. And that's one that fails to represent the target in some relevant way. The trick is to choose a sample that reflects all the relevant features of the target, even though you don't always know which features are going to turn out to be relevant. So let's say you're generalizing about the methods used by cat burglars to bypass security systems. Do you make your sample represent the educational level of cat burglars in general? It might be relevant, since the more educated thieves might use more sophisticated tools. What about right versus left-handedness? 
would that be relevant? Or hair color. Some things are more relevant than others, right? And bias is best avoided by the selection of a random and varied sample. So we consider a random sample a sample resulting from selection by a procedure where every member of a population has an equal chance of being selected. And varied simply means there's variety or variation among the members of the sample population. And since such selection is random, there's no guarantee your sample will be a perfect representation of the target population, which is why we also have to understand what's called margin of error. Even when taking random samples, there's a random variation from sample to sample. The range of random variation is called our error margin. The larger the sample, the more probable the random variation is going to fall within a given range. Larger the sample equals a smaller margin of error. We could also throw in one other concept, which is called the confidence level, and that's the level of probability regarding the accuracy of our margin of error. But let's set that one aside for now. As sample size increases, the margin of error decreases. But note, there's a diminishing return from taking larger and larger samples. The margin of error decrease is most substantial between sample sizes of 200 to 1500. The margin of error does not substantially decrease at sample sizes greater than 1500 since it's already below the 3% mark. But notice, on the graph, there's a sharp decline in the margin of error as we increase the sample size initially. But around the 12 to 1500 mark, the curve begins to flatten. It is generally not worth the additional cost and effort to bring the margin of error down much below 3%. So we would say that around 1500, like I said, that's essentially the sweet spot. Now turning to the question of manner and procedure, we want to know how is the evidence gathered and how was it examined? And this raises many possible questions regarding methods of evaluation. How many similarities and differences are studied? Were all possible explanations considered? Was all the evidence taken into consideration and how critically? Was there a control group if we're talking about some kind of experimental study and so on? So with our presidential approval rating scenario, was everybody asked the same question? Did the questions include factors that would elicit certain responses, say based on gender, race, ethnicity? And were all the responses counted equally? And all the new data needs to be reflected upon in light of our prior knowledge, what we call background knowledge. Does the new information contradict anything known or believed to be true? Does the new information enable a better explanation than one previously given? For instance, the observed redshift which is a shift into the red range of the spectrum as a light source is moving away from an observer. When astronomers were looking at distant stars, they noticed the red color indicating that they seemed to be moving away from the point of view of the observer. And that didn't make sense according to what was known at the time as the steady state model of the universe. Ultimately, scientists ended up abandoning that in favor of an expanding model. Now, returning to the example of eating red meat, let's consider procedure and background knowledge taken together. How might we determine if there's a correlation between eating red meat and the risk of colon cancer? Do we use a sample study of randomly selected Americans, a sample study of randomly selected meat eaters, a sample study of randomly selected people with colon cancer, or an observational study of meat eaters over time? And again, what are the pros and cons of each? Well, with the first one, with A, colon cancer might be something relevant, I think, to a study looking for a correlation. And it isn't common enough to think that a random sample of the general population is actually going to capture the trait in a significant way. With B, we might get many instances of red meat eaters, but we won't be able to predict which members currently in good health are yet to develop cancer nor will we have any possibility of a control, such as non-red meat eaters who develop colon cancer, by which we might gauge a difference in cancer rates between the two populations. With C, all we have are people with colon cancer, and if they all ate red meat, we could overestimate the correlation since we don't know the proportion of red meat eaters who never get colon cancer, say it's 99% of the population. With D, we would be able to capture future cancer growth, but we would miss data from non-meat eaters unless we actually built that into the study, and we would have a more difficult task to carry out, and we wouldn't necessarily know for how long to maintain the observation. So you can see, you know, there's pros and cons in each. Some of them have more cons than others.
So let's conduct an observational study, say conducted over a period of about 30 years, and plot the results on a graph. Does there appear to be a correlation between eating red meat and the risk of colon cancer according to the data gathered from the observational study? Well, a pattern does seem to emerge. So how does that fit with our background knowledge? Does it seem to contradict what we thought? Because that might be a reason to be cautious in accepting a new conclusion too quickly, or definitely too dogmatically. Or does it fit well with our previous experience and thus strengthen our views? And most importantly, does this indicate that red meat causes cancer? Correlation is not the same thing as causation. There are many possible explanations for a correlation. For example, and this might be far-fetched, but perhaps there's some deficiency that might cause both an elevated risk for colon cancer and the craving for red meat. Or more likely, there's some other element in a lifestyle associated with red meat eaters that might play a causal role. People who eat red meat also tend to consume less fiber. They also eat other less healthy foods. Maybe they exercise less, and the list goes on. A test for causation requires something more than just an observational study. It requires what we call the experimental method. And we'll be dealing with things like experimental method and Mills method down the road. One last scenario. In a presidential election survey, we want to determine which candidate is leading in the race to the upcoming election. So what is the best question to ask? A, who do you think will win the upcoming election? B, if the election were held today, which candidate would you vote for? C, who would you prefer to vote for, X or Y? Now think about how the phrasing of the question might elicit a particular response or how the question may lead to a wildly inaccurate conclusion. And by the way, you should have picked B on this one. And as for which method of surveying should lead to the most accurate estimation, do we A, poll all the people attending the Democratic National Conference, B, pull all the residents of the candidate's home state. C, pull a random selection of 1,500 people from across the nation. D, pull every person in the U.S. Or E, pull a random selection of 1,500 registered voters from across the nation. I think you should be able to figure out that one on your own. Now, I hate doing this to you again, but after everything we've been through, I still have a few more fallacies to throw in. So let's take a look at a short list of fallacies related to what we've been discussing. Some will be new, but many of these are actually going to be review. So the first one is a bias generalization from a bias sample, which uses a sample that might be large enough, yet it still fails to represent the target class. And that's because sometimes there's so much diversity within a population that even a large sample cannot be truly representative. Second one is hasty generalization or conclusion resulting from too small a sample. And that results in overconfidence in the likelihood of the conclusion. We studied this one before. Let's take an example. These 10 movies are poorly written, so most movies are poorly written. Versus, these 10 movies are poorly written, so some movies are poorly written. You can see how the second one is actually a stronger argument because we're a little bit more hesitant in coming to strong conclusions from such a small sample. Of course, it's possible to make such a generalization legitimately if the small group we have is truly representative. The next is anecdotal evidence, which is a kind of hasty generalization. In these arguments, you simply tell a story using one or two examples that are meant to demonstrate a general truth. It's psychologically persuasive, which is why we hear it so often, but it's still just an example of a sample of one or two. The next one, self-selection fallacy which is overestimating the probability of a conclusion based on a self-selected sample, one whose members are included by their own decision. Such sampling actually overrepresents people who want to participate and underrepresents people who don't feel very strongly, or at least not strongly enough to participate. An example might be a public opinion poll taken on a website or on a radio talk program. Then we've got a slanted question where a question is phrased in such a way as to elicit a particular sort of response. Again, when conducting a poll, it's possible to control the outcome to some extent through our language. Are you in favor of the government instituting measures to protect people from dangerous secondhand smoke? Versus phrasing the question, are you in favor of the government infringing on a citizen's rights to smoke in public? You could see how either is going to elicit an opposite response. Next is weak analogy, which is overestimating the probability of a conclusion derived from an argument by analogy, especially where the analogy breaks down on too many points. And the last one is just vague generalities, a general statement that's too vague to be meaningful for any practical purpose. 
like when a group is vaguely named so as to limit your ability to know what constitutes membership in that group. Say, religious people. What does that mean? Or when an attribute or quality is so obscure that you can't identify whether a thing actually possesses it. Like, kids are too into themselves. Or liberals are harming the country. In these situations, what we need to do is employ a sampling frame or precising definition to avoid the ambiguity. I think that gives you a good idea of the different considerations that we need to keep in mind when we're evaluating empirical probability. Next time, since we've been talking about induction and inductive probability, I want to turn our attention to certainty so that we can see how inductive certainty lines up with other types of certainty. Until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.